Hello, Odi. Hello, Nadav. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? Uh, a bit uh, cold. I mm -hmm. had the uh, air conditioning on uh, a few days ago, but uh, feeling better, feeling better. Yeah. Sounds good. So, yeah, we have something interesting today. So we're not going to analyze data per se, but we're going to show you how to use a, a natural language processing model by OpenAI, it's called GPT-3, to do basically whatever you want. It can do a lot. So uh, let's, let's take a step back and explain what I just said, if that, that's okay. Uh, NLP natural language processing uh, is a field in machine learning. Uh, which means that you can process language, understand language, or try to author different types of documents. So that's a very broad description of what NLP is. And OpenAI is a company, there are a few companies uh, like them, which work in the field of uh, machine learning. They have different deep learning algorithms. One of them is a is a model called GPT-3. And they haven't, they, they usually these models are developed by training a lot of, uh, training on a lot of data sets and a lot of corpus or a lot of types of documents. And eventually you get a model which can compose different kinds of documents. So let's give, give an example of what we're going to, uh, uh, to do or what this model does. So I've already loaded the open AI uh, playground, as they call it. So that's beta.openai.com slash playground. Maybe you need to register first. And now you can you can try and see how the model works. For example, if I run if I write down a write a blog post for LinkedIn about me being excited for starting a, starting a new job as a data scientist. And once you click on submit, the GPT model is going to try and complete uh, this uh, uh, instruction. Maybe give it some more uh, maximum length. No, no, it's a, yeah. So there are different types of parameters here like what you referred to here is the maximum length. So you can take it up a notch and uh, allow it to uh, compose a longer uh, post here. But even without, even in the previous length, you can see, I'm really excited to start my job as a data scientist. I've always been interested in data and how it can be used to help businesses make better decisions. I'm looking forward to working with a team of talented people to help make our company data, our company's data even more valuable, right? So that's a very generic uh, post, but it uh, uh, it corresponds with what I, with the instruction I wrote here. And there are different types of models you can run with uh, like this, the text Da Vinci is the smartest model. Though it's also the slowest and it's also the model that costs the most. Uh, and there are different types of parameters like temperature, I guess the temperature adds a uh, randomness, right? Controls the randomness of the result and a lot of other uh, um, parameters you can play with here. Now, obviously this, this model can be very par powerful, but if you want to implement it in, a, in your own software, you can't use uh, this uh, playground over here. You need some kind of an API, right? An application programming interface to work with the model. And, OPI, and uh, OpenAI built uh, an API you can work with. So that's what we're going to show now. It's very simple. It's going to take like 10 minutes and you have a script which works completely with this. Uh... So there's only one uh, first prerequisite for it to work. As you register with uh, OpenAI, you get something like $18. And each query like this costs a few cents. So you can have like a lot of experimentation on that uh, initial credit that you get pro bono. 
and you just once you register you just have to go to view api keys and then you'll see the uh, api keys and you just uh, click on copy and you get your own api key i'm not going to reveal my api keys here and i've already generated an api key spe especially for this uh, session here so again you just go view api keys and create a new secret key and then you copy the secret key and paste it somewhere in a in a file in your code usually it's best practice to keep the keys in a separate file which you don't commit to the github repository you work with so it's kind of a secret you don't want it laying around in the code so let's uh, having said that let's go into r and try to to work with it and uh, we're going to demonstrate uh, uh, something interesting here because uh, OpenAI has already built uh, an SDK, like a, a Python library that you can work with. So I'm also going to show how you can use this uh, Python library, even though you're working from R, right? So let's uh, go ahead and, uh, and save this untitled script. Let's call it... A open AI sample. So the first thing that I do would be to load the libraries. I'm interested in tidyverse as, as I usually use it. And this time I'm also going to use another library called reticulate. Did we run into reticulate in the past in one of our previous videos? I don't remember. I don't think. Well, I think we mentioned it. Yeah. But it didn't show it. Okay. So Reticulate is a, is a great package. It gives you the power that you have in Python, but within R. It basically runs Python. So you can do whatever you want. So if you have a, a package already developed in Python, like OpenAI's library, you can use Reticulate to call it and you don't have to redevelop everything in R. It's the same ex cool. example for, yeah, it's, it, it is. So, and it's the same example for like uh, when you use uh, AWS, uh, Amazon uh, Web Services, they have a pretty good package called Bottle 3. It's an SDK, it contains all of their uh, API, all of the commands that you can use, all the different services. It's implemented in Python, so you can use it in R when you load the reticulate. So the first thing to do uh, in this uh, context is kind of a one-time operation, one-time operation to uh, uh, generate a Python environment. So the first thing would be that we want to generate an environment which includes the, the Python we want, the, like the Python version, and the package that we want. We want the package called uh, OpenAI. That's the name of the package uh, from, uh, well, from OpenAI. So Reticulate for this has a, has a command called a, a code in V, something like the create. Probably virtual create. So do, there are two types of, uh, it's called the create. There are two types of mm -hmm. environments uh, in, in the reticulate uh, library. Uh, one environment is a virtual environment and the other is a Conda environment. Conda is kind of a separate Python, right? It's a different, has some yeah. differences. So I usually use a uh, Conda. So what we want to do is give it a name. And our name is going to be open AI example. And we want to tell it that we want the open AI package. That's the name of the Python package we're going to use. So if you would have wanted to use uh, AWS, for example, you'd go and add Boto 3, which is the name of uh, Amazon's uh, uh, if, Python package. Yeah. If you wanted, could you have done the same uh, with the virtual env instead of the conda? Yes. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's probably the same for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's okay. like you, you can see that you, you have the same arguments. Yes. Pretty much. 
my experience with Conda is it's must it's, it's much more robust when you install packages. So I just prefer prefer using that. And for Python, we can use 3.9. And this is something that you do only once. And uh, once you run it, you can just say, so now it's going to take the, the uh, this package here, it's going to download it from the Python repositories and it's going to install it. And then we, uh, we will be able to use uh, uh, the environment called OpenAI example. This command here is actually a command that you run only once per computer, right? Because once you've installed uh, the environment, it exists and you can just use it. So I'm just going to comment that out because we've already used that. And once this installation finishes, okay, so you can see that the installation completed. And now we can just go ahead and do a reticulate use Conda ENV with the name that we gave it, Open AI Example. And what we got, we, we actually didn't get any response, but actually it loaded the environment and it can now use this package. So just to like, uh, just a, a short note here, you can see that I keep using the, the package colon colon and the, the function's name. I don't actually need this part because uh, I did a library here. I called the package, the library, but I find it some, sometimes useful because I can get all the comments like this. It's very, it's easier to remember. Namespace. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's, uh, uh, let's show you a, a few things about uh, how you can run Python from within Reticulate. So for example, if you want to, to import a package, so in, in Python, you just go in and, and write import and the package package's name, right? And that imports right. the package, you can use the, the comment. But here, since we're using R, you have to use an R command. So there's a command, there's a function called import. So we can uh, go something like this, open AI and do import. Import is also a function from reticulate and open AI is the name of the package. So that's the, the package name from Python and we're just giving it an object name in R. This can be any name that we want. And now we the, the package is actually available from within R. So we can use the different functions within uh, the OpenAI package from within R. And you can already see all the namespace. You can already see all the different yeah. functions from within the open in, uh, OpenAI package that we can use. So we're going to use something like probably uh, query or something like that. There, there's, there's a command that allows us to, to run them. That's us very slick. Yeah, let's just try and run version. And we got an error here, probably it's, yeah. So you can see we got some kind of a response. This is a Python response. Yeah, so, you got back a module, a module name. Right. So uh, uh, the next thing we want to do is read our, uh, our key that uh, in the beginning I said uh, that I already downloaded. So I'm just going to do a read, a read file. And the key is in credentials, open AI key. So it's, it's here and uh, yeah, there's part of it here. Don't try to use it because I'll delete it afterwards anyway. <laughs> you can generate your own. Uh, and now we've got the key. And we've got the package and we're ready to try and uh, query uh, our model. So in order to uh, for us to reach out the uh, GPT-3 uh, API, all we have to do is let's go with something like, this is going to be the response of the, uh, of the GPT-3 model. And we're going to use OpenAI from within it, we need to use completion. So uh, this is the model module that gives us a completion for a sentence that we gave. And we're going to create. Now we have a few parameters that we have, like a few arguments that we need to use here. 
So, uh, and all, all of this is also documented within uh, the OpenAI's documentation. So you can go and, and check all of that if you want uh, to get uh, further information about how to use this function. But the, the first thing is to, to tell it what model, what exact model to use. So as I said, uh, as I showed earlier, there are different types of models. Uh, the strongest one is called text da Vinci 002. So that's the model we'll be using now. And we have to give it a prompt. So the prompt is the instruction that you give or the beginning of the story you're going to give it or whatever you want. Like we can tell a story about zombies. Uh, this is a story about zombies, but not just any zombies. These zombies used to hide in the desert, eat snakes, and hunt lions. Okay, so this is going to be our prompt. <laughs> and uh, this is the equivalent of what we said earlier, like write a, a post about blah, blah, blah. And next up, we can give it the temperature. So as we increase the temperature, the randomness increases. As we decrease the temperature, like a temperature of zero, we'll probably give it a deterministic response. So let's go with a high value here. 0.7 is what we used earlier when we demonstrated in the uh, playground. Uh, max tokens. So max tokens is like the length of the response or the maximum length of the response. In character. The model... Yeah, so tokens are not exactly characters. There's a different yeah. kind of of, uh, of counting here. Uh, we're not going to... I'm not sure exactly how they count it, but, but the pricing model, their, their pricing model is like a, a few cents per token. So yeah. you have to be sure about what the max length, like if you keep it too long, the cost is going to be or might be too high. If you keep it too short, then you might get partial answers. So you, you have to that you have to go with a bit of experimentation depending on the type of uh, of uh, application or use in case you're using. So max tokens, let's go with 250. And there are a few more. Like there, there, there were a few more arguments here. Like you can see top P, frequency penalty, presence penalty, best off. I'm not sure if you have to specify them. So probably they have default values. Yeah, probably they do. So let's, let's try to go with that and see if we get an error, then we'd know that we have to specify them as well. <clears throat> now let's go ahead and try to run this and see what's the response going to be. So, okay, we got an error here. Oh, okay, hmm. no API key provided. So I did read the API key, but I didn't use it anywhere, right? I have to uh, first like initialize the key or let it know that I'm using this uh, and it's okay. So the way uh, the way I want to use this, the way I, I want to define the key is just using open API and there's an API key here. And then I just have to take this key here, the string. So the way this works is probably like a global variable. Once you define that, this function knows that the key is stored here. It should work now. Oh, okay. So this is an interesting error. We got an error here. You can see 250.0 is not of type integer max tokens. So you want to take a guess? Why did we get this error? Well, 250 does look like a, like an integer from here. Is it cast by default as float? Yeah, so that's, it is, it is, it is a float. It, it's not an integer. That's an R. Usually, yeah, usually we don't, uh, like usually in R we don't, uh, we don't really notice this stuff because integers and floats are not that meaningful in when you analyze data, usually. 
but it, it does matter. Like in Python, there is a difference between 0, 0.0 and zero, right? Zero is an integer and 0, 0.0 is uh, exactly. a floating point. So uh, in R, if you want to have an integer, you have to write L, L for long, right? A long integer. So yeah. this is an integer. It looks the same, like 250, but this is not an integer. This is an integer. Interesting. And yeah, and the reason the reason that this is important is because what R is doing when we're using reticulate is that it uh, it transforms the different objects and types of objects in a pre pre specified manner. So numerics in R turn to floating point in Python, and integers don't turn to integers. So and this function needs a definite integer and not a floating point. So uh, this should be, should be sufficient to overcome this error that we got. Okay. Uh, so we got... You have a typo in a here. temperature. I do. I think... Temperature? Temperature. What would that be? Maybe. Temp uh, oh, I do. I do have a typo. Thank you. Yeah, now it's thinking about something, and that's always a good Looks sign. Promising. Yeah. And we got an answer. So let's try and see what we got here as the response. So you can see that we got a response. This response looks like a JSON, probably is. And a, we have a JSON with choices. And the finished reason is length. Probably this means that a, our definition for max tokens was too short. And if we would have given it more tokens here, the answer would have been the same, but longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and what else do we have here? Log probes. Now, I don't actually know what log probes is. Something related. With Probably no problems, log. Okay. Yeah. I maybe. guess. Yeah, might be. And yeah, <laughs> and then you can like... Uh, if we take back, this is a story about zombies, but not just any zombies. The zombies used to hide in the desert, eat snakes, and hunt lions. They were called Bushmen, and they lived yes. in South Africa. Yeah, it develops. Okay. Keep on reading. They become yeah, zombies all the time. They is become that, zombies. Is that something racist? I hope that's not racist or anything. No, it's just <laughs> a, like a starting point they got hooked into. Yeah. The Bushmen were a nomadic people who lived in small bands. They were experts at survival in the harsh desert conditions. They were also skilled hunters and could track and kill even the most dangerous animals. But then something happened. The Bushmen started to change. They began to care, crave human flesh. This is actually <laughs> an interesting story, right? right. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> they became because violent and. It sounds believable. You know, Bushmen, they live in the desert, they hunt, they, I guess, eat snakes. I don't. I don't know. So it started from a, like a, a make sense point, right? Not what we expected, but it does make sense in the context of the story. Yes. Pretty yes, cool. Yes. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So they be, eventually they became violent and aggressive. They began to attack and eat people. The Bushmen became zombies. The, <laughs> the first reports of zombie attacks came from the Bushmen themselves. They would tell of seeing their friends and family members change into monsters who would try to eat them. <laughs> Some of them thought that Bushmen were just making up stories, but then more and more reports started to come in. It became clear that there was a serious problem. The Bushmen zombie outbreak quickly spread through South Southern Africa. The Bushmen were not the only ones affected. Other people, including some Europeans, were also turned into zombies. The zombie Bushmen were a serious threat to everyone in the region. They were difficult to kill, and seemed to be able to keep going even when they were severely injured. The only way to stop the cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah, it keeps <laughs> us in suspense. And this is the next chapter. So just just to you know to to kind of extract this text, what you want to do is use probably there's a uh, if you can do something like I'm wondering if that's yeah. So you can do something like choices and then and then this is this is like a 
JSON here. So just text here. within choices. Yeah. So this 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 actually this whole thing is is a JSON, but R keeps it keeps it as as text. So we want to turn it into a list or something. Uh -huh. like that. Probably into a dictionary. Is there a dictionary in R? Yeah, there is. It's called the list. So you can you can list. do something like I think you can do something like read JSON maybe read JSON expects a file I think maybe from JSON from JSON probably from JSON would probably work yeah a txt must be a JSON string URL or file I think we could do, do something like this. Yeah, nice. so this is, yeah, I might be, might be, no. Uh, so this is not. It exactly means that you're not system. holding a text. What's the type of the uh, choices? Environment. Environment. Yeah, that's not like, let's try to turn it into a character. Yeah. So this might be more like a JSON, but still not. Oh, I forgot to put the S character here. Oh yeah, now we got it. So this is a response list. And you can probably go ahead and extract the text from here. And there you have it. If you want the original text, let's just go ahead and paste that with that. Paste this with this one here and there you have it this is the character <laughs> and you see the the slash n here is actually a new line that's the character for new line and and that's okay i think we can probably use cats yeah and now it looks more like a story with the paragraphs split and everything nice isn't it it is yeah and a very like a very quick way to do it it's it's like you saw it took us a few minutes from from inception to it's, implementation it's crazy how easy it is yeah and you can you can even go crazier like you can even combine that with uh, translation. So, for example, a lot of my projects personally are in Hebrew, and the GPT three doesn't well. It supports Hebrew, but the results are not that well because it probably wasn't trained on that many Hebrew data sets. So you can do everything you like in English, and then use another uh, machine learning uh, models. Like there are different types of APIs for translation, either. A Google a Cloud Platform or AWS or whatever you want to use, so you can do everything in English and then just translate it to whatever language you want. I guess that the models that you OpenAI uses here or developed here works pretty well in the common languages like English, Spanish, probably other. So you can try that out and see for yourself. Pretty cool. Yeah, it is. So the code here is going to go to the uh, to our repository. We're going to put it there. Obviously, if you want to recreate it, you just have to download the key and install the packages, and, and there you have it. Your own AI model, which does whatever you direct it to do in terms of writing different descriptions of whatever you're thinking about. Do you think, slightly off topic, that DALI, which is also by OpenAI, does the text to images? Basically, here it does text to a description by text, and DALI does text to description by pixels. Probably they have the same core, or like the same mm -hmm. language processing engine, and it just splits into different visualizers. I don't know. So I, I, there are probably some commonalities between the two, but there are fundamental differences. So let's think about uh, machine learning in general. 
you want to have some kind of a supervised uh, algorithm, right? You want to teach it somehow. You want to teach the algorithm what kind of prompts should lead to what kind of results. So with this NLP model, you have prompts which lead to a textual result. But with the DALI uh, uh, product, you want text which leads to a visual result, like an image. So you probably train it on something completely different. You train it on images. So what you do when you when you do a supervised learning model, when you, when you build a supervised learning model, what you do is take a, a, a if if we talk about the DALI, for example, you take different kinds of images with their description. And you teach the model that this kind of description leads to this kind of image, right? So you get a lot of oil paintings, That's... and if it is the word oil, oil painting, you know what it would know what the characteristics of an oil painting is. If it would see a pencil drawing, it would know yes, what kind. Yes, but that implies that it has a lot of uh, understanding of context because you teach it with a million pictures of monkeys and skateboards, but you never teach it with a monkey on a skateboard on a sidewalk in New York, which you can tell it. It needs to understand the different things and align them in context in a make sense image. So the basically it's, the product is a pipeline, right? You feed it some, day, some uh, text, it analyzes the text, and then it generates something out of it. At least the understanding of text and the complex patterns that you put into it and the context it generates, I guess it could be the same as, uh, it's the same engine. It understands language as natural language uh, processing, basically. Yeah, so as, as I said, there are probably some commonalities, but a lot of differences as well. Because the outcome Super is interesting. completely different, so the training is completely different. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it is so a subject we've talking like we've been talking about uh, uh, Dali. So let's at least show an example of Dali, right? So if someone doesn't know yet, this is by the way, it's an active uh, 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 subject of study. It's called the transfer of domains because you want to teach, you don't want to teach. To teach GPT-3 took a lot of time and a lot of resources. It would be better for everyone if you only had to teach the differences or not to teach everything and transfer whatever you taught GPT-3 into DALI. Transfer the understanding into a new domain. Yeah, yeah. That's where everything is, uh, where everyone is trying to get now. Yeah. So, uh, uh, zombies in the desert. Hunting lions. Lions. So give it a start. Be oil, oil on canvas or digital or what would that be? Graffiti. How do you spell graffiti? Uh, F F F I T I. Yes. You want to check that before I run? Yeah. yeah? Is that okay. Yeah. Okay. You know what? I can believe it. Just a second. I already ran it, so. Probably it would understand. Yeah, it was right. Oh, nice. So this is what DALI does. It understands the language and tries to give you, in this case, a graffiti, graffiti. drawing. Yeah, graffiti of... wasn't a good, uh, good choice. <laughs> of zombies uh, hunting lions in the desert. No, it's, it's actually nice. I, I like it. Yeah. It's nice. Give it instead of graffiti, give it the uh, digital art. You know, you can even specify like a, a wide angle lens and all that kind of stuff. Time of day, everything. At sunset. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> The things that people do with this uh, uh, amazing it, it's about, about uh, it, it's amazing yeah it's about iteration you get something and you get variant you can see i actually read that there is someone someone who submitted digital artwork yes. that he generated in dali and that it wanted a contest yes i'll tell you something about that specific case a lot of the headlines uh, they say that uh, 
at the end of it, he did specify on his submission form that it's computer generated. There was no uh, secret about it. That's it. Yeah. But the yeah, computer generated might be a bit ambiguous <laughs> or unclear at this at this stage uh -huh. of the technology. Yeah. Fair enough. It's, for but, sure it woke up a lot of people. Yeah. But I, I think I think that it he deserves the reward. Like it, for it, sure it was an and, amazing and, picture. And, and as as yeah, it was an amazing picture. And as I read it, he still had a lot of iterations to do within Dali and and, and a lot of work within yeah. Photoshop, like fine-tuning the image so yeah it takes a, a lot of skills just different skills than artists it's a scary time to be uh, in that kind of field yeah. Yeah. so yeah that was nice and short in yeah. contrast to our previous videos so yeah, uh, yeah let, let us know what you thought and let us know if you found any interesting uses for gpt3 and uh, Subscribe to the channel, write some comments, and we'll see you in the next uh, episode. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>